We're now recording. Great. Thank you, Mr. King. Good morning. This is the meeting of the comprehensive land use plan committee. It is 840 AM um, on October 11th, 2022, and we have a quorum. Can we start out with a roll call, please? Brent Rubin. Here. Deborah Carpenter. Here. Dustin Bullard. Here. Jasmine Anderson. Okay. Jerry Hawkins. Here. Krista Nightingale. Here. Linda McMahon. Here. Annette Aguilar. Matt Houston. Peter Goldstein. I'm here, but unable to change my name on the screen. It's okay. <laughs> and Roy Lopez. Present. All right, we do have a quorum. Great, thank you, Mr. Agu. Um, our first item of business on our agenda is we have several folks online signed up to speak. Um, our first speaker is Karina Arellano. Not online. Great. All right. Next up, Jonathan Sokoop. Online, I'm moving over to panelists now. Great. And each speaker will have three minutes this morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Jonathan Sukup. I'm here on behalf uh, of the. Mr. Sukup, we need to be able to see you in order to hear from you under the open meeting slot. Are you able to turn your camera on? Can you can you see me now? Um, yes, and I just saw Miss McMahon online. So let the record reflect that she's online at eight forty-two a.m. Mr. Sukup, whenever you're ready. Uh, yes, my name is Jonathan Sukup. I'm ninety-two hundred five South Central Expressway. I'm speaking on behalf of the Floral Farms neighborhood. I just wanted to remind folks that three years ago we started down this path of uh, getting an authorized hearing for our neighborhood to look at the zoning issues uh since that time the neighborhoods banded together and put forth a, their own zoning plan we have several residential houses that are that are zoned industrial by means beyond me uh, that we're looking to remedy because our neighborhood seems to catch only things like concrete plants and gravel truck parking lots and various criminal entities um, we'd like to we think the neighborhood's at a turning point we'd like the city to help us make these zoning changes and help us improve our neighborhood for a safe and clean uh, area to rival some of the other parts of Dallas instead of being one of the worst parts of Dallas. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm fighting a cold today. Uh, anyway, I just wanted to remind you. I appreciate anything the you know, council can do to help us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sukup. Um, next speaker is Janie Cisneros. Not online. Alicia Kendrick. Not online. Pauline Logan. Online. Okay. Morning, Miss Logan. I think you may be muted. Okay, thank you. I live out here in the community of Joppa, and I'm surrounded by lots of 
um, polluting industries. And some of them are like the shingles manufacturer, uh, batch plant, the concrete manufacturers. And I'm concerned about uh, what a what place type like, like Joppa would look like. You know what? Let me see if I can. Okay, uh, there are approximately 450 to 500 homes out here in the neighborhood. And I think that deserves um, priority attention in residential and industrial mixing with um, when you're considering the place types. Another concern I have is like the nearest community to ours is like five to six miles away. So how would um, place type connected to Joppa support its development plans. And uh, also I'm concerned about Joppa's economic development as related to another place type. And I'm just concerned that, and I appreciate your attention to this matter. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Logan. All right, next, Evelyn Mayo. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good morning. So my name is Evelyn Mayo, and I just wanted to echo uh, the concerns that were raised by Mr. Sukup at Floral Farms, as well as Ms. Logan in Joppy. Um, there are three areas to my mind that require prioritization when it comes to land use changes on the grounds of public health, environmental justice, and racial equity. And those are Floral Farms, the Singleton Corridor in West Dallas, and the Joppy Friedman Town. These are all three areas that have adjacency or are intertwined with heavy industry and major sources of pollution. And I want to encourage y'all as you consider which place types go where to consult with the neighborhoods themselves and refer to their neighborhood led land use plans, both of which Floral Farms and Singleton have. I also hope that additional bilingual outreach on what place types are and what their purpose is, is widely disseminated in advance of the discussions of where each place type should go. I think it's asking a lot of residents to digest this concept of a place type and in the same meeting determine the most appropriate place type for their community. And finally, I'd like to understand how these place types align with the city's housing policy, racial equity plan, climate action plan, economic development plan, so that the public can see the clear links between those policies and the implementation of these place types in Forward Dallas. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. Um, next speaker, Kamishia Richardson. Not online. Okay, Christine Hopkins. Good morning, everyone. My name is Christine Hopkins. I'm with the West Oak Cliff Coalition, and I'm here echoing comments made by Miss Mayo, Miss. Ms. Logan and Mr. Sukop, which is that we as as community advocates do not understand how these place types are going to be used to promote the city's goals of racial equity, environmental equity, and housing equity. The city has just passed a racial equity plan that says we need to look out for industrial zoning next to black and brown neighborhoods that says we need anti-displacement policies to prevent um, black and brown and working class people from being displaced from their own neighborhoods. So how are these place types supposed to help with these goals? And especially in, in West Oak Cliff, we don't understand if we have just been through an area planning process for our area and our area plan is about to get passed by city council. How do these place types now fit into our area plan is the place type that is superimposed on parts of this area going to change everything we've been fighting for for amendments to the West Oak Cliff area plan. So, you know, for example, areas that fought to make, be single family with ADUs. Uh, but they're next to transportation. Are they no longer going to be considered suburban residential place types? Are they going to be given a different place type? And then we're going to have the same fight all over again about mixed, you know, 
multifamily going into that neighborhood. It's very concerning because we have a HUD complaint uh, through the Coalition for Neighborhood Self-Determination against the city for industrial proximity to Black and Latino neighborhoods. Um, the HUD has found such a complaint valid against the city of Los An uh, city of Chicago, and I think that you know these place types are they sound geeky, they sound like a great planning tool, but what is the reality of them, and how are they actually going to help solve Dallas's big problems? And and also, how as community advocates are we supposed to go tell people why they should be showing up to these upcoming meetings? There are only six meetings throughout a city of fourteen districts. This place type is something that I think you all found difficult to understand exactly how it's going to be used. So how are we supposed to explain it to our community when we just got done explaining to them things like what an area plan is, what an authorized hearing is, and now we've got to throw in a whole new concept of place types and, and get our community educated and to figure out what we even want to advocate for. So there's just two major concerns I have. One is I don't think the city is going to be able to get the community engagement it needs with six meetings in 14 districts at an entirely new planning concept. And that's Thank you, Ms. Left. Hopkins. That's Thank your you. time. All right. It looks like two of our speakers on the list are now online. Um, Alicia Kendrick. Hello. Are you able to turn your camera on, Ms. Kendrick? Um, I'm not able to at this point. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, state okay. law re That's requires funny. us to have um, anyone virtual with their camera on. Um, Janie Cisneros. Hi, good morning. My name Morning. is Jane Cisneros. I, I understand this committee will be identifying priority areas where changes in land use and development should be encouraged. And I'm here today to encourage you to prioritize a Singleton Corridor in West Dallas because it's an area that is in great need of attention. We have our neighborhood led land use plan that lays out the need to deindustrialize the heavy industrial uses along the Singleton Boulevard. And right now there is industrial and residential mixing, which caused it has caused immense damage to our neighborhood from an environmental perspective. We're fighting for clean air, clean soil. From a health perspective, we're suffering from diseases and illnesses tied to our bodies absorbing the toxins from these industrial sources. And then from a neighborhood health perspective, our community is shrinking due to the current industrial zoning that's in, that was imposed upon us that blocks homes from getting rebuilt or new homes from being built. Um, we really care about our neighborhood and want to see it thrive. Our plan promotes community oriented businesses, housing that is affordable to current residents, cultural arts, um, culture and art centers, public green spaces. Our vision for our community is outlined in, that, in our plan and should be honored when designating a place type for the Singleton Corridor in West Dallas. We need residential place types and deindustrialized based uh, place types so as not to perpetuate the environmental racism issues that we deal with today. Neighborhoods like ours tend to be left behind and Singleton United Unidos Neighborhood Association wants to make sure that we participate and collaborate with the important work that you're doing so that what happened in 1987 doesn't happen to us again. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cisneros. Is there, Mr. King or any of our other registered speakers online? I think it was Karina Ariano, Alicia Kendrick, who I think was having camera issues. Ms. Kendrick, were you able to get your camera? To work, not at all. Like, I don't know what's okay. going on with it. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. I, I apologize. Unfortunately, the, the folks down in Austin require us to, to have your, your camera working in order to hear from you. Um, Miss Richardson, is, is she online? No, sir. Okay. Thank you, Mr. King. All right. We will move on to our next item, which Mr. is approval. Yes. I want to see, uh, can I ask a question of one of our speakers? Of course, Mr. Lopez. Uh, I had a question for uh, Ms. Hopkins. She's still available. Yes, I'm here. Ms. Hopkins, thank you for uh, bringing out this, uh, the 2 concepts. 1 is place types and, and getting residents to understand what that even means. I think that's a critically important issue. 
Uh, and then the second uh, point that you made was with regard to place types and how, and how we can use this tool as a tool for racial equity. Uh, you asked us to, to consider those um, as, as we come up with recommendations, because uh, we're still going through this visioning process now. What are your thoughts on, on these two concepts? How do, we, how do we get place types into the communities where they can understand what it is we're talking about? And two, how can we use place types as a tool for racial equity? So I, I on the first thing about community engagement, I think we need to have an explanation ourselves. How are the place types going to interplay with neighborhood plans, with area plans? Are they um, like, uh, that my understanding is they're a vision, they're not actual zoning. Correct. And so why should the, the community care about the vision? Is it gonna have the same weight as an area plan? So that if you have a place type in your neighborhood that allows multifamily, that means that if there's an authorized hearing, all of a sudden, because that place type is assigned to your neighborhood, the authorized hearing is gonna be stacked against you and you're gonna get your multifamily because it's in the place type? Or how, like, what, what is even the implication of being assigned a certain place type? I don't understand it. I don't know how I'm supposed to explain it to anyone else. Um, that's, I think, the first thing that we need to get some clarity on. Um, and then the second, like, the community engagement-wise, it would be great if the city could put out a bilingual video that we could circulate to communities to explain what these place types are, hopefully in a way that it's understandable to the everyday person. And then with racial equity, I think we need to be looking most importantly at the industrial ad ad adjacencies. Um, I'd love it if it also you could look at it from a displacement angle for the sake of West Oak Cliff, but I think the most pressing issues are the places that have public health issues like Floral Farm, Singleton United, Joppy. And the question is, if there are, there's a place type for residential, there are pla place types that allow industry, can they be right next to each other? How does there have to be a buffer between them? Uh, are places like Floral Farms going to get their, their residential designation or are they going to be thrown into an industrial designation? So the first thing is, you know, what place type is gonna cover those neighborhoods? And then the second is, What's the adjacency? What's the one that's going to be right next door to them? Um, so I guess that that would be my best answer to those two questions. Thanks, Ms. Hobby. Yeah, I mean, we, we know that we have some work to do uh, with regard to educating the public about what Forward Dallas is all about. So we know that uh, we have some work to do. Uh, again, thank you for bringing this to our attention. We know we have an issue here. Uh, but uh, as a community advocate, um, just help us, help us help your communities because uh, sometimes we just don't know what we don't know. And, and part of this is, is an educational component that we need to um, work on. And we do realize that we have gaps here. So thank you for bringing this to our attention. Thank you. And I think Ms. Gillis, did you? have some stuff to add with respect to the interaction of, of place types and recently or soon to be adopted area plans? Sure, there seem to be a lot of questions in there, so I wanted to cover a few things. Um, first of all, this is all part of the process. So all of those questions from Ms. Hopkins are all part of the process. So, which is why we've set up the next series of meetings that are happening that, yes, there are seven meetings throughout the city um, where we'll be discuss discussing these issues, but then there will also be many more localized focused area meetings as well. So we are trying to capture interest and opportunities for education at various different levels throughout the city knowing that this is a citywide plan and we can't go door to door for every single person in the city, we wanna make sure that we capture um, or provide an opportunity for people to pop in and learn about it at these seven larger area meetings. And then obviously we'll be zooming in 
to the small areas. And this is just the next series of meetings where we'll be starting to talk about the place types and how they work. So all of that will be presented. It doesn't all get worked out here at the Comprehensive Land Use Plan Committee. This is, we vet through you first and as we're simultaneously going out into the community. So a lot of those questions about adjacency, I can guarantee you those are priorities for us when working through this plan as well. Um, you know, I think we have, you know, you'll see in our presentation that our priority topic areas include housing and displacement and housing attainment. They include environmental justice. So as we get into the presentation today, you'll see those priority areas that we're looking at. Um, and all of the different, we have a list, we have a running list probably now of about 71 priority areas throughout the city. So, um, there's a lot of that coming through, which we'll be presenting and making very public um, as we move into this next phase of engagement. How this will, how place types will fit into area plans and neighborhood plans and things like that. Obviously, the West Oak Cliff area plan is very recent. We made, we were very, we made sure that there was consistency between area plan recommendations and what could be recommended from a Forward Dallas perspective. So area plan, Forward Dallas, unless there's some area that we find out after the fact that needed some fine tuning, Forward Dallas will just reiterate the area plan recommendations. The area plan will basically be uploaded into the Forward Dallas framework as a component of the comprehensive plan. Again, all of those pieces as well will be presented to the community about how they all fit together and how all of those puzzle pieces fit together. Great, thank you, Ms. Gillis. Um, any additional questions for our public speakers this morning? All right, uh, next item on our agenda is approval of the September, I think it's 13th, 2022 minutes. Can I get a motion? So moved. Thank you. We have a motion by Commissioner Carpenter. Do we have a second? Second. Thank McMahon. you. Second by Ms. McMahon. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. The motion carries. All right, next item on our agenda is the visioning workshop. Is that you, Mr. Agu, or is that Mr. Nolan? Okay, great. Good morning, Mr. Nolan. Good morning. There, there we go. Great. Great. Sorry, Lawrence, are you kicking it off? Yes, I can go ahead. I okay. want to share your screen. Sure. Is that coming through? Yes, we can see it. Yes. Okay. Now, can you go full screen, please? Yeah. All right. So, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining today's uh, discussion about focus areas and place types. Um, I think all the discussions that actually occurred. Uh, with our public speakers, we're actually going to touch upon today. Um, so very timely with what we're going to be speaking about uh, in today's meeting. Uh, next slide, please. So quick overview of what we're going to talk about. Uh, do a quick introduction in terms of who's here from staff and the consultant team. We're going to do a general overview of the place types um, in terms of what they are, the relevance, and how that plays into this project. And they're going to delve into the main bulk of this exercise or this meeting, which is the focus areas and looking at um, those general uh, topics that are leading to the areas discussion that we're having today. In addition to thinking about how we're going to be engaging the public with those uh, focus areas as well. And then delving into the next steps in terms of what we're going to be doing from the community standpoint, what we're going to be doing within staff and how the rest of the year looks like. Um, so before I go to the next slide, um, there are a few others in our in this conference room that I just want the, the team to know about. Uh, Patrick Blades, who is a senior planner within planning and urban design, 
uh, will be helping to lead a lot of the development and the research that we're doing from the focused area perspective. Uh, so just want to be able to introduce his name to the project team. And as we move forward, uh, you'll see a lot more of his involvement in terms of what we're doing. Uh, next slide. All right, so when we talk about place type, so I want to take a step back and just reiterate that this, the land use committee, um, there are basically two or three steps out in front of uh, what the public sees. So typically, we first come to them to see how these topics, how these concepts, how these definitions um, run with them, and that's going to help us when we go out into the public to be able to know how to better um, relay the information, define the information, and break down the information to the public. So um, the information they're going to be seeing today will eventually be the same presentation or, or work that we present in front of the public, but this is meant to refine and tweak how we do that um, in the public. So in the next actually few weeks, or actually next week, we're going to start that place type discussion that we had a few months ago with the club, and that's going to be about getting everybody to understand what each place type is, a concept of place types, and how that does apply uh, to their community. So right now what we're going to be talking about, it's primarily for the, the land use committee. And since we've had a uh, few meetings prior about place types, uh, we'll be unpacking this further as we go into the community um, to be able to vet what these place types are, how they, re how they relate to certain areas in the city, and getting feedback in terms of how they can be modified or tweaked based on community feedback. So just a quick overview of what place types are. Uh, they are not land uses. Uh, they're basically um, a collection of suitable land uses um, that lead to a particular type of, of place that we want to see in the city. So this sheet that we have on the, on the slide, it shows a matrix of uh, different land uses up top. And then on the side, on the, on the left column, place types. So if you notice, each place types has a collection of different land uses that amount to what each of those place types are. So for example, a regional green space would encompass agricultural, private open space, public open space, um, in terms of embodying what that particular place type is. And it's meant as a more macro level of understanding land uses throughout the city, because like we mentioned um, when our direct, assistant director mentioned that the city of Dallas is massive, we have to look at it from a broader perspective and the place types helps us to be able to do that and have a conversation throughout the city without delving into each specific land use, uh, which will take forever if we did if we were to do that. So the place types helps us to basically embody what a place could feel like and, and be like within the city, and we can start to look at what those individual land uses are attributed for each of those place types. Uh, next slide. So. Concept and idea of place types isn't, uh, we didn't bring, make it up from scratch. Um, the same concept um, is actually within our current four DAOs from 2006. Those are called building blocks. So if you look at this particular slide here, the map on the, on the left is, in a sense, what um, the old four DAOs called place types. Those are general uh, land use. Uh, places that are meant to get an idea of what the city looks like from a macro level. So on this particular slide on the right side, you see a list of what we call building blocks. Those are the same concepts that we have already looked at within the old forward Dallas. I mean, an old forward Dallas, and we're trying to modify, tweak, enhance uh, those place types, what we're doing now to be able to be, to be more in tune with all the nuances in terms of residential, commercial and other types of development that we see in the city. Uh, as we look at this particular list, and go to, sorry, next slide. If you look at this particular list in comparison to the place types, the draft place types, I want to say, that we started to look at, uh, the place types that we've developed so far, there are more categories because there, there are more nuances in terms of how we want to identify these different places in the city. Uh, but again, this is not the final uh, list. This is the first stab at what place types are. The community is going to help us figure out what these should look like, what they should be. The club is helping us do that too. But as we compare from uh, left to right in terms of what these are, we can notice that there are a lot more detail on the ones that we're developing now. And the idea is to have a little bit more uh, specificity as we look in through, if we look through the, the city 
when applying these uh, land use place types. Uh, next slide. And also important as we are looking at these place types is also critical that we're looking at the community themes and the issues that were brought to us from our first round of the community engagement in the spring. So all those topics and ideas, issues that were brought up from the community, those are gonna play into how we and where we apply those land use recommendations in the future. So from an example, walkability and bikeability being an issue, uh, the overall bucket of mobility and connectivity, we can start to link those issues to themes and to topics that will be um, expounded upon within our land use policy recommendations moving forward. So we wanna make sure that we are linking all those, uh, all the feedback that we've gotten so far into how the place types play out and eventually where they play out in the city. Uh, next slide. So for our next uh, phase of this workshop is gonna be the bulk of what we're gonna be talking about. I'm gonna hand it off to our consultant, um, Brandon Nolan with Housel Levine, and is gonna talk about how these focus areas are gonna come into play and how we're looking about, how we're looking at these place types and these focus areas uh, through different topical lenses. So I mentioned before that the community provided us with a lot of those lenses, again, from environmental justice to transportation and connectivity, there are some of those issues that play into some of these focus area types and Brandon Nolan, uh, I'm gonna hand it off to him to kind of explain how we're gonna be tying those uh, two pieces together with how we develop and look at land, land use within these focus areas. Thanks, Lawrence. Um, so yeah, in, in talking with staff and, and reviewing kind of areas of focus throughout the city, uh, we've kind of landed on these, these six preliminary kind of buckets or categories and thinking through kind of what are some of the, the areas of change where we know we want to talk about changes in land use and, and hence changes in, in kind of place types and how they're applied. Um, we really kind of tried to look across the city and, and do a survey of kind of common issues that are being encountered, common issues that are being presented by groups like we were just hearing from. Uh, and so in kind of comparing and looking at all those notes, uh, staff have come up with kind of six major categories. And, and like Andrew mentioned, you know, we've got about 70 areas we're, we're talking about here collectively, um, but we're just gonna walk through um, kind of prototypical examples for each of these six categories and, and talk about how the place types can be applied in each situation. And then also kind of what is the tie back to maybe broader city policy that's supported in other documents like were mentioned uh, earlier uh, this morning. So uh, the six categories that uh, we're gonna be talking about, again, these are kind of focus areas or, or areas of change by type, kind of basically the, you know, as we're talking about land use over the long term, there's certain areas that are gonna be remain very stable and we're just gonna kind of maintain and improve what they are. There's other areas where we're really looking at kind of a shift happening. And, and so that's the focus of today's conversation are those areas of change. Um, so the six categories are environmental justice, and we'll walk through each of these, uh, housing affordability, choice and displacement, corridors and urban design, uh, connectivity and TODs, revitalizing and developing areas. So kind of areas that are being impacted by major kind of catalytic projects. Uh, and then rural and agricultural slash greenfield areas. Um, so the, the first uh, area I wanna talk about is environmental justice. Uh, and this has, again, been brought up already this morning, clearly top of mind for, for several neighborhoods in the community, for, for several advocates. Um, and so some of the common issues that we're looking at and why we're kind of evaluating these areas in more detail, we know we've got some conflict happening between industrial uses near residential. Um, you know, in some cases, that's where we've got kind of a historic legacy where industrials kind of hanging around, even though it's it's a non-conforming use in the zoning, um, it's it's kind of still present and, and um, you know, can't go away in, until the business decides to, to close. Uh, floodplains, you know, kind of where we've got development being impacted by the presence of floodplain or expanding floodplain due to climate change. Um, and then a desire for housing choice and a variety of housing types kind of in this context of industrial kind of conflicts happening. And also we wanna rec recognize that a lot of the areas experiencing this environmental justice problem are areas that are historically minority communities. So um, the kind of communities due to kind of historic policy decisions have been located alongside uh, these kind of conflicting land uses. 
so um, kind of, you know, staff uh, are definitely kind of paying attention to things. We know what areas are in discussion. Um, today, we want to talk about floral farms as an example of kind of how this place type discussion um, is going to play out. Um, we don't have, oh, I guess I want to emphasize this off the bat, we do not have um, a place type map that we're shopping around at this point. We have, um, I think, our own understanding of how place type should be applied in certain areas, but everything is is kind of in discussion. Nothing's been drafted, nothing's been formalized. And so today really is about kind of how should we be applying the place type approach to these different areas. Um, so the, what we're gonna walk through for each of these examples, again, we've got floral farms as an example for environmental justice, but we have an example for each of the other areas as well. Uh, we're gonna show you an aerial, a kind of existing land use aerial uh, to give a sense of where we're at in the, in the community. We're going to show you the existing land use layer that kind of translates the aerial into kind of that mix of land uses that are current. Uh, and then we're going to show you the policy from that building blocks layer um, that uh, Lawrence just showed um, to kind of show you what the kind of previous 2006 plan had uh, for these areas. And then we'll kind of overlay those and, and have a discussion about how we think place types could be applied to these areas. And that's where I'll back out of presentation mode and start taking some notes. Um, so floral farms. You know, here we're at the, the intersection right along the, the Julius Sheps Freeway here at uh, Simpson Stewart Road and Central Expressway. So um, kind of right in the middle of the um, zoning area that's being discussed currently for floral farms. And if you look at kind of what's on the ground right now, um, you've got uh, a lot of kind of public open space, uh, a lot of outdoor storage and light industrial areas. Um, and a lot of um, kind of, again, just kind of industrial areas mixing around with, uh, with some residential um, kind of at the, the major intersection. And again, you'd see those land use conflicts occurring uh, within this existing land use framework. Uh, and then this is the um, uh, application of that building blocks layer uh, to this area. So this is again, kind of existing land use policy for the 2006 building blocks uh, plan. You can see the landfill obviously taking over um, on the, the kind of east or southeast side, uh, a lot of industrial, uh, and then commercial center or corridor um, coming down kind of where the LBJ freeway intersects with Central Expressway. So that becomes kind of a node that was highlighted in the previous plan. Um, so um, that's the current, um, kind of land use framework that, that exists with uh, residential um, being kind of identified for the areas to the west. So with that said, um, you know, this is that that current application overlaid over top of an aerial. Um, we know, um, I'm going to back out of my full screen here. Um, I've got kind of, I can got the color palette here for the, the place types that we could apply here. Uh, and I guess I just wanted to kind of walk through like how should place types be applied to this area? We want to respect kind of the planning and discussions that are happening uh, currently. Um, we want to recognize the kind of connection between place types, land use, and then these broader policies that we're talking about regarding environmental justice, regarding, regarding housing, affordability, and choice. Um, so that's that's kind of the, the discussion we're having today for each of these areas. Um, Lawrence, anything you want to frame out there before we kind of dive into talking about the place types? No, I think you hit it. Thank you. Okay. Um, so again, area of change, right? Where we're, we're recognizing there's a, a conflict occurring with the industrial. Uh, we're recognizing that there is an established interest, an established neighborhood um, that wants this change happen. Um, so how do the place types apply? And so this is an area where right now the, the previous policy was that industrial application. So you've got the landfill and the industrial area layer uh, being applied to this, this area. Uh, so this represents kind of an opportunity within the place type approach to say, what is the future vision for this area? Um, so um, in terms of, I guess, Lawrence, do we wanna start just kind of working through and doing an open call? How do you wanna approach the, I guess, feedback with the group? Yes, I think we can open it up to the, the panel uh, to be able to provide this initial feedback in terms of uh, which place types from there.
experience and their understanding uh, should start to apply at this particular location. Um, the same kind of work is going to be done as we go to the community and other bodies, but I think we want to make basically make this open for a discussion uh, with the panelists and the, the, uh, the commissioners to be able to figure out and talk through which place types um, should start to play out in this example. So before we jump into discussion of, of potential place types of this area, I imagine there might be some members of the body with with questions. So maybe we could get to questions for staff first and then jump into the, the visioning piece of this. So I can't see all of y'all on the screen right now if you're online. So Actually, if you I do have, have this is yeah, is that, that Mr. Hawkins? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah, go ahead. Um, just some clarity uh, around language clarity. first. Uh, how do you all define minority? So I can answer that. I think that was a, an error on the presentation. So that that should not be uh, minority. Should be uh, people of color. Uh, so we will up, update and modify that to reflect uh, that language. Thank you. Um, my follow up question is: um, How do you all de decide those? Um, the, the place type uses, like, um, for instance, I think you all gave a, a brief description, but I wanted to just um, get more information on how you decided the, that these were the focus areas. Uh, for instance, I think you had environmental justice and you had, um, you all used the word minority. How did you all define and, and, and create those topical areas? Uh, so those topical areas were from uh, several uh, points of, I guess, input. So one being uh, kind of staff research, one being uh, previous planning uh, research that was done, uh, council leadership and feedback. And that's kind of where the current list and body of these are. Uh, it's mo mostly specifically focused on these, these types. So when we do talk to the community, um, environmental justice, those are on the screen, housing affordability, uh, connectivity, those are the issues that come up and that we feel that these focus areas should start to address and, and look at, uh, but also wanna make sure that this body is also helping us to figure out what those topical areas could or should be. So these are the initial six that we've uh, come through in terms of our analysis and research. Uh, but if there's more that needs to be added, uh, we wanna make sure that we add, add that too. But from our discussion purposes, this is kind of what we've come up with. And the, the examples to the particular uh, focus type um, I guess issues, we do have a, a running list, like uh, our direct, uh, assistant director mentioned, of 70 plus areas. We chose one out of each of those to be able to have a discussion uh, related to what we're talking about today. Um, and then also we're gonna be unpacking what more of those could be or should be as we look into our conversation with the community. They're gonna help us figure out what more of those focus areas are, but for discussion purposes, to make sure that we are Kind of focusing on the, the issue types that we need to look at. We want to identify one per those issues just to make sure that we are talking about relevant issues that are, um, are, are tangent and directly related to our land use um, initiative here. Thank you, Mr. Gu. Last question is um, when I know you all are going to get into this, but uh, number two, housing affordability, choice and displacement. Does that include uh, policies that uh, intentionally displace people of color? Eventually, uh, this plan is going to lead to uh, policy, looking at policies. Yes, I think what we're looking at too are two, twofold. Um, land uses, how that plays into housing affordability and choice and displacement, and then also to um, identifying other plans and areas that do have policies that have led to that. Right now, we're still kind of high level in terms of just identifying the, the larger topical issues. But the, I think that the goal is to lead to identifying policies um, that are leading to that. And also, how do we use this plan to update or tweak or change policy that helps to um, uh, tackle this particular issue? Yeah, thank you for that uh, clarity. You know, I mean, I've said it about three times already. I'm going to say it one more time. I think. It's really important to know that policy to have the analysis to even choose focus area types. Uh, but again, I'll, I'll just, I'll just say that again as a, um, advice to the, uh, 
uh, folks working on this. I think that policy is really important to know focus area types. Thank you all. Thank you. Members, additional questions for staff? I see Commissioner Carpenter. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to try to make this a question. It's more of a, I'm just trying to visualize, or I guess I need to ask a question. How, how can a play, it seems to me we're asking a lot of a place type to reconcile the unreconcilable. I, what possible place type can rectify the injustice of putting heavy industrial next to residential? Yeah. I'm going to answer your question because you actually, your question is actually what we talk about too uh, within land use. Land use has a specific um, amount of what it can and can't do. Um, so what well, you mentioned, like we can't address the entire body of what you just mentioned, but we, what we can do is look at how do we uh, orient the land uses in the future of the city of Dallas, how can we orient um, land uses, future land uses, excuse me, to be able to start to reduce the effects that the current land uses have on our communities with environmental justice, like you mentioned. Um, but again, that's only one piece of the larger body that the city can do. So I think as we look at what land use can do, we can, know, we can say we can orient land uses in this particular area, this configuration, so forth, but that's kind of limited in terms of what that will do in terms of um, the whole body of that particular issue. There are other departments or other fields that lead to that particular piece and addressing that con concern. But our purview, our kind of, um, what we're kind of, our scope is land use, the orientation and location of that, and how that plays out into the community. That's kind of what land uses and place types kind of can do for the future of, of addressing a particular issue like that. I have another question about you know, the concept of buffering, which is, has come up before and which I saw played out uh, when we did the cumulative zoning overlay in the, the late 80s, which is, let's see, ask a question. Are you envisioning a strategy in which you define a buffer as a need to upzone part of a residential neighborhood to provide some separation between a residential neighborhood and an incompatible heavy commercial or industrial use? Because that has not, that has been a very detrimental policy to these neighborhoods that exist in these um, situations. And it really doesn't make sense from a racial equity or from a, uh, from equity or health standpoint to say intensify the residential density to expose more people to the hazards of living next to industrial neighborhoods. I think we're going to need a a 180 where we actually look the other way and go, what can we do to lessen the severity of the intensity? Because what's happened, it's almost like a game of rock, paper, scissors. And when you have industrial and residential next to each other, industrial has always won. So right. are we envisioning, a, <laughs> how do we affect a sea change in attitude here? That's my question. Right, so this process, the uh, for Dallas, uh, future land use uh, discussion that we're having is the first step in terms of getting to that point that where we can start to talk about the proper uh, combination, the proper orientation of land uses. Um, you also mentioned something about zoning. That's another actually project that we're working on with our zoning ordinance rewrite. Those are actually happening in tandem. We hope to have, hope, hope that happen in tandem. So for Dallas speaks to the zoning piece and the zoning piece is what enforces those land uses in our city. Uh, so, like I mentioned to several committee members on signed conversations, we can have the best future land use map and plan um, that addresses everything we're looking at from the community. But if it's not carried out through zoning, it's, I'm going to say it's useless, but it's not, doesn't have that much teeth. So zoning is what's going to start to in, enforce the vision that we set forth through this plan. And our discussion that we're going to have today is to talk through some of those issues that you mentioned how do we start to orient these land uses in an example like floor farms to start to make this picture of land use to make it look like what the community wants after that's complete after that's done throughout the entire city then we start to do the, the hard piece which I, which I think is actually the zoning piece how do we enforce our zoning to be able to enforce the the vision that we just laid forth with the four Dallas so I think this particular this is the first step that start to kind of look at this particular example, which place types, which land uses 
need to be in these areas. Let's talk through that first. And then the next start was going to be about how do we apply, how do we update our zoning to enforce that vision moving forward? Thank you. Members, additional questions for staff before we hop into the visioning piece. Uh, I'm sorry, um, I do have a question and I'm sure this has already been explained and I just missed it. Um, the idea is that today we are assigning what we think should be in these neighborhoods and then over, and then you all will take that to the community um, or when you go to the communities, are you going with a blank map and saying, you know, assign what you think is appropriate? What, how does that process play out? Right. No, great question. So the, the latter. So I think this is okay. this body is only one of those um, inputs that we're receiving when we go out to the community. Is also going to be a blank slate getting that input uh, as well. Also, we're going to be doing the same thing with focus groups. Doing the same thing with uh, city leadership. We're getting different inputs from different perspectives, and it's staffs. Uh, what the works has to do is put that together uh, and then come back to the community, come back to this body and show uh, what's been developed from all those uh, pieces of input or directions or uh, locations of input into a draft uh, place type map or, or vision. So I think this is the first step in terms of starting to figure out what needs to happen in these areas. Um, again, like that's a great question. We're going to go out into the community and do the same thing. It's going to be a blank slate. We're going to identify some of these focus areas that we're mentioning with you all too as well, but there isn't going to be a, um, a recommendation that we're showing them. They're going to give us that input and then we come to come back as staff, put it together and then present all that body of input to, to, to the community and to this body. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I, I don't know some of these areas terribly well, so I'd be uncomfortable. Um, assigning anything to them until, you know, hearing from the community first and seeing what they think it should look like. So I appreciate that, uh, that explanation. No problem. I think in addition to, so we also mentioned this too. So not everybody's going to be familiar with all these focus areas, but it might be, uh, what's still useful for us to get as staff and the, the project team is, uh, e either topics or things to think about with these more topical areas. So again, like we mentioned. We're looking at this from a more topical area perspective, and we're using one focus area as a discussion, as an example in terms of how we can apply uh, a, a land use or future land use to those areas. So I think, you know, give us feedback in terms of how we look at these topical areas uh, from a high level. That'll be beneficial. Uh, when we do go out into community, we can have a little bit more of that type of structure, and they'll provide us with maybe what that needs to look like. Uh, since they're the experts in their communities. Any additional questions for staff members? All right, why don't we hop in? If anyone wants to kick it off, feel free to go ahead. If not, I'm happy to hop in. All right. It's been a while since I've I've read the the neighborhood led plan for the area. I've slept a few times since then, and did not have a chance to re-review it. But but I know two things that that struck me as as important in this area is one, providing a community green space and in gathering space. I know there's the the green space area. And the other is, is probably the more obvious one, which is not, not what to put on there, but what not to put on there. And that's potentially, you know, deindustrializing the area and not including industrial land uses in our future land use vision for the area, keeping in mind the existence that there are existing industrial areas. So it might be an X across the industrial future land use type or place type. And are we, oh, there we go. I see the little sticky. All right. 
Um, and then, yeah, that example of the community open space comment, um, that's something we can definitely have as part of the discussion for whatever residential place type you'd want to see in this area. So it sounds like there's definitely a desire to kind of shift to the residential, um, whether the kind of suburban residential or maybe some mixed residential. Um, that's an example where the, the open space piece, that's a component of the place type, right? So we want to have quality kind of centrally located parks as part of a suburban residential environment. Um, and so that would be something that kind of is discussed within the definition of the place type, but you wouldn't see a green dot on the map, for example. So on the far left, isn't there a green space? Um, place type, or is that meant for larger green spaces as opposed to, you know, greens, you know, I guess smaller sorry about that. parts um, that are worked into? Yeah, so there is the regional open space. That is oh, meant regional, to be, okay. yeah, that is meant for um, kind of greenways. Um, and kind of things that are going to be, again, at that regional scale where you've got that amenity as the place itself, right? It's not something that's tucked into a neighborhood. It's something that is its own destination and its own kind of entity. So uh, in this example, um, you know, the, the greenway that kind of weaves through the west side of the community would be a regional open space uh, place type, I think, uh, that we could apply to uh, most of this area here, uh, and really then it becomes a discussion, all right, how are we balancing with that as a backdrop to a community? W what is the mix we're talking about happening in this area, right? Right, Brandon, would you mind uh, panning to the matrix again? Sure. Um, I can do that. So we've got this here. As a reminder, yeah. Um, right. So I think as we're looking uh, and we're talking through what could, should be in this area, um, I think that the overarching idea or the concept is what kind of place do we want this to be? I think just basic, like what kind of place do we want this example uh, to look like? We do have these list of place types, but I think just not even thinking about these place types, this is more for reference. What type of place? Do we want this floral farms or similar types of areas to embody? And then we can start to make these place types um, apply to that. So it might be one place type, it might be a combination of place types, but if, so we're not hung up and like trying to figure out which place types to apply. Uh, just think more broadly, like what kind of place do we want this to be? Is it, do we want it to be a, a vibrant residential community? Is it more of a rural type of area? I think those kind of questions can probably help us to kind of craft and think about what we're trying to look at here. And then staff, what we'll start to do is kind of put those together with what these place types could and should be. But when we do go out into the community, it's going to be very general and very high level, just like that. Like, what kind of place do you want this to be? And then we'll start to kind of then delve into the more details about what land uses attribute to that type of place. And, and I can't put my, so my a, finger a on a... I'm sorry, I, who was that? This is Jerry Hawkins, Chair Rubin. Oh, great. Yeah, go ahead, Mr. Hawkins. Um, so I have a just a question about the place types uh, because they're, um, you know, Floral Farm is a very particular area. It is kind of both rural and urban, particularly with industrial <laughs> zoning all around it. Uh, and is next to the uh, Great Trinity uh, River Forest. Um, some of the place types for um, this urban residential neighborhood doesn't have the the regional green space and the kind of the agriculture needed for this type of place. I'm interested in in how does the Floral Farms um, neighborhood plan and they also uh, also have a award winning um, plan for a park already designed. When do those come into play with when talking about these place types? And I can start and then Brandy can kind of, uh, maybe actually before I start, uh, Brandy, could you go over the difference between urban residential neighborhood, what we have here? Uh, the, again, these are kind of um, semantics and 
what we have with the rule, just kind of explain the differences, and then I can kind of piggyback on that explanation. Sure. I mean, the, the rural residential neighborhoods really meant to represent those areas where you've got um, kind of a lot of, and we have an example we'll get to in Kleberg later, but uh, if you want to think about Kleberg, for example, they, you know, it's a mix of some kind of spotty kind of residential development. Uh, a lot of it, though, is large scale, uh, you know, deep lots, open space on the backside of very rural kind of residential housing, um, open space that uh, maybe it's been platted, but it never kind of developed, um, kind of opportunities to really actually encourage agriculture. So um, rural residential is very, is very rural in character um, versus the suburban or kind of the, the suburban mixed residential and urban residential um, where we're talking about Kind of more traditional neighborhood fabric um the mixed residential versus suburban you end up having a bit more um mix of multifamily and single family attached housing uh, housing variety versus the single the suburban residential where it's much more oriented towards single family detached uh, as well as kind of attached slash townhome uh, housing uh, and then the urban residential um really if you look at this kind of middle row you can see all these white dots um, that's showcasing kind of how much flexibility there is to really kind of create a core urban neighborhood where you've got that interweaving of public and private open space small neighborhood corner stores maybe some office uh heavy focus on multifamily mixed in with single family attached and single family detached housing so um, really as we ramp up from suburban to mixed to urban you're getting a bit more dense you're getting a bit more mix of housing product and rural is kind of that most pulled back version where maybe some of the uses are similar but from an, a kind of development standpoint um, you've got opportunities for actual like agriculture to take place uh, you've got a lot of open space public and private Thank you for that that uh, description, and I think um, that's kind of um, illustrative of my question. Um, when like policy is not taking into place when these place types are are shown, uh, for instance, like agriculture, I didn't see agriculture on any of the urban residential neighborhood place types, um, and because of historical policies like. Uh, lack of grocery stores, folks have to create agriculture in their communities. Uh, Dallas has like the East Dallas community garden, which has been there for years because there was no residential grocery store in that neighborhood. I don't, I just don't think the place types reflect the historical nature of creating place types for communities of color. So I, I'm just, I'm just really, um, kind of highlighting that, um, that the universality of these place types don't meet up to the need of the communities. And I think uh, one thing that you mentioned, I think we're actually looking at too, uh, which is actually a good comment. So the agriculture land use, I think that we're talking about doesn't exist in this example that we have here, this iteration, but I think in terms of what's can happen, I think a mo maybe more of a urban ag type of land use that can be applied to something that's a little bit more urban. Uh, so I think agriculture is a little bit more uh, provides a lot more space for being able to kind of grow crops. Uh, but I think something that's focused on the urban uh, land uses that we have in the city, uh, maybe, maybe it's more specific to that urban ag type of land use. That's something that we can look into to adding to, to this list. But just I think it's a good point. Yeah, and, th and that's actually something um, we have seesawed on internally. Um, when we first put this together, there was a longer list, and we tried to trim this down to simplify it. But... Uh, urban ag was definitely seen as kind of a secondary tier to agriculture. So agriculture being large scale farming, which is still possible in parts of Southern Dallas, for example, versus those more isolated instances that are, it's kind of a, a community space supporting local food access. Um, so that was, that was added on as a supporting land use uh, in a couple of the communities were and that's actually been added as a result of those kinds of conversations. Yeah, I think that's really important. I know several folks in Fuller Farms have horses and cows, goats even, you know, so that's really important. Mm -hmm. And I guess that, that begs the question, do we want to call it rural residential because of the nature of that area? Or is the vision to become much more dense um, and kind of have a compact maybe neighborhood node that goes with rural residential on the edges? Um, so that's, I think, how we kind of talk about applying these these place types is, is thinking through 
how does that vision translate? Um, and I can't, I've been trying to, to find a copy that I could do a screen grab of the, the community plan and show you here to kind of talk about that, but I can't, I can't grab it while we're in this meeting right now. Um, so if anyone's familiar with that plan and wants to talk about that vision, we can, we can kind of workshop through that too. I, I just wanted to, to hop in real quick. I think for this area, we should keep the discussion higher level and focus on some of the environmental justice issues and not necessarily get down to the parcel specific because we do have an authorized hearing process that's happening right now where we're looking very detailed at the property by property level. And so this is sort of an example of how you know, the, the plans are different. The land use scale is different. Through the mm -hmm. authorized hearings, we will be looking at, yes, is there open space on X property or however it may happen. But here, it's the bigger issue I think coming out of this is, you know, maybe some of the residential types if we're talking rural residential, but then also how we're handling the conflict between there being residential and industrial adjacencies and how that's handled from the more panned out scale. So I just wanted to to bring that up about the authorized hearing and the sort of more property per, property specific discussion that's going on there. Can I ask a question along that line, please? Uh, yes, we'll go to you, Mr. Goldstein, then Commissioner Carpenter. Okay, thank you. Um, Chair Ruben, Ruben you, you had mentioned um, deindustrializing in the future, and I think um, Ms. Gillis is, is also suggesting, well, um, what, how are we going to solve the current problem um, with this adjacency issue? And I know uh, Ms. Hopkins spoke to it this morning, Commissioner Carpenter, um, about these adjacencies. So my question in terms of a buffer, um, as we move forward and put place types on a map, um, is a highway um, considered a buffer? Um, are, are we talking about distances in terms of feet? Um, or are we talking about what might be an appropriate um, place type to buffer between industrial and residential? And of course, um, I think all of us are in con or have mentioned that, that this is really a community decision um, you know, with some of our suggestions, but I guess my question is, um, if we have a buffer between industrial and residential, what might that be? And when I'm looking at the list, um, flex industry caught my eye, but I'm not too sure what that is um, in terms of, you know, is that a uh, environmental, uh, potential environmental issue? Uh, how do we create these buffers? What place types are appropriate? Mm -hmm. And so that's it. Yeah, we can talk about a couple different things in terms of buffers. Like you said, there's the internal site planning, which is the physical distancing. Then there's within the place types kind of transitioning of uses, which was uh, touched on earlier. Uh, and then there's actually just using a place type as a district as a whole to establish even more of a transition. So, um, you know, in this area, again, pretty compact, as Andrew is saying. So we're really focused just to kind of highlight some of these issues. You know, can we talk about what's appropriate to happen kind of along this side uh, of this right of way that can help transition away from the landfill? Um, talk about what's the appropriate mix of, of uses we want to encourage along kind of the expressway corridor, um, you know, do we want to talk about flex here or do we want to get away from that altogether and discuss um, kind of more residential and commercial in this area instead? Again, kind of looking at the building blocks layer here, it's showing commercial on the south end um, with development happening of kind of part of this, this green space. And then the, the, the vision was still industrial. And I think it's clear from this conversation and, and from earlier remarks that the industrial discussion is really um, quite dated and we want to kind of talk about this area transitioning to something else. Also a quick time check just to make sure we're kind of on track with our discussion. So this is one of the six uh, topics that we're going to be speaking on. I think in summary, what I've heard so far, like Brandon mentioned um, the current um, future land uses, the building blocks that uh, Forward Dallas 2006 provided 
um, what I'm hearing too as well is that it, that it doesn't um, align with what the community has or wants uh, there now. So I think the, the rural residential, uh, more open space uh, that we mentioned, I think those are all what I'm hearing and I think how we can start to apply um, these new place types into this area. Again, this is the first stab at you know looking at and thinking through what these need look like. The community will give us a little bit more detail with what that looks like, but I think for this particular example, I think it's pretty clear that uh, the future land use with the building blocks here doesn't make that much sense because it's kind of focused on industrial and landfill and the community wants a little bit more uh, rural residential and open space to be applied uh, in this particular example. So I think um, that's kind of what I've noted. I think Brandy noted that too as well. Uh, I want to make sure that we do get every uh, everyone's feedback related to that, but if there isn't any other kind of perspectives with this area, uh, I think it would be a good time to kind of maybe take another pivot to the next topic and the next example. Again, this is not uh, the end all, whatever you say here isn't set in stone. This is the first uh, place where we're having this conversation and we just want to make sure that we are um, continually open up the, the communication channels in terms of these areas as we talk through them as well. May I add something here? Yes, please yes. do. Yeah, trying to stay very high level. I think the most important thing here is that um, some sort of place type be allowed wherever the community, or be applied wherever the community wants it to restore their residential, you know, zoning rights. Because, you know, they got overlaid with industrial so long ago that we need to respect that. And while there might be, you know, places where some more density is, uh, for residential is appropriate, I, I think we do need to respect the historic um, you know, character of the residential uh, neighborhood and, uh, you know, pay attention to that. And I think also this is a good example to point out. I think there's just a, a lack of nuance in the place types as far as commercial and industrial. I mean, industrial hub and flex industry just aren't going to, in my experience, they're not going to provide enough nuance for the kinds of uses that are out there on the ground and um, uh, to address uh, Mr. Goldstein's um, question about appropriate buffers. I think it's going to have to be a, a land use type buffer, but the, the, the types of industrial and um, commercial place types we have right now, are, I don't think are going to do the trick. Members, any additional comments? Okay, let's move on to item number two. All right. Um, so the next area of focus, again, kind of types of areas of change that we're looking at um, are areas where there's there's an increasing need for a discussion around housing affordability choice and, and um, displacement. So high growth areas where the, we've got teardowns occurring, um, uh, where there's a, a call to protect single family housing, but maybe also look at um, the addition of uh, accessory dwelling units as a way of, of providing for housing choice. Um, decreasing affordability trends, so areas where we're just seeing prices going up and, and, and also displacement happening as a, as a result of that. Um, and then um, there's areas, um, kind of unique areas within the city where um, you don't, you lack conservation districts in place in these high growth, those growth, yeah, growth areas. Um, and so the, the Mount Auburn area um, was highlighted um, in, in reviewing kind of um, staff concerns and, and noting kind of areas of change. The Mount Auburn area is highlighted as kind of one of those examples of a, a housing affordability uh, focus area where we really want to focus on kind of that housing choice and displacement issue uh, as we talk about uh, change. Um, and so before, maybe before I get into the land use, uh, Lawrence, anything to add on the history or I guess choice of this area? Might be muted, Lawrence, or not here. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to have um, our senior planner, Patrick Blaze, speak um, on this one a bit, and we can kind of have a conversation from there. All right, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, again, my name is Patrick Blaze. I'm a senior planner with the city of Dallas. Um, so in taking a look at housing affordability, housing choice and displacement, um, we were taking a look at the Mount Auburn neighborhood here in East Dallas. Um, 
you know, it's predominantly a single family, uh, detached homes. Um, this is a, a community that started development in the 1920s and 30s. Um, there's some duplexes and a, a couple of other like small multifamily in here, uh, but it's pretty indicative of what's going on in the city of Dallas where you have um, these 800, 900, 1100 square foot homes um, that are being, uh, frankly, the, they were affordable, you know, 10 years ago, five years ago. Um, but at this point in time, um, they're being purchased. Um, a lot of them are being knocked down and being replaced with um, much larger single family homes. Um, and again, uh, this is just one example, um, but um, everyone here um, probably knows other communities where this is uh, clearly the case, um, where you're losing um, affordability in these neighborhoods. Um, you're losing some of the fabric of those neighborhoods. Um, and, you know, it, it's also those types of communities where you're experiencing a lot of displacement, um, either um, members who have lived there for a number of years or families who have lived there for a number of years um, can't afford to stay in these communities um, because the prices are going up. Um, you know, I, again, it, it's Mount Auburn is a neighborhood where you could buy a two bedroom, three bedroom home 10 years ago for $100,000, but now um, people are offering 300,000 just to knock down the house and, and, and build a bigger, um, you know, build a much bigger home. Um, and so that's um, one of the areas of focus that we're looking at um, for a, a, a community that is experiencing um, that they're, again, they're, you know, streetcar suburb neighborhoods um, that were built, um, you know, 60, 70, 80 years ago. Um, but now are, are um, the, the fabric of that community is definitely changing. Thanks, Patrick. Um, and so when you look at kind of what previous policy was um, from the, the building blocks layer, we have this residential neighborhood application along with urban neighborhood um, to the to the southern end um, here. And so um, this is the, the area overlaid. Um, so again, you can see from a place type standpoint, this is actually very similar to I think how place types uh, process functions as, as uh, Lawrence pointed out, where um, you have a traditional kind of residential neighborhood, um, might call this urban mixed area, like neighborhood with some increasing density on the south end. Um, and so I think part of the question is for this area is do we need to think about, um, you know, in providing housing choice, do we want to stick to kind of existing um, kind of condition and, and really look at implementing housing policy um, at the local level? Do we want to talk about a shift in place type where we're, we're allowing for uh, a broader mix of housing types, uh, maybe something that allows for more multifamily as a way of combating uh, the increasing pricing, right? but you have this conflict point with uh, kind of preserving historic neighborhood character, kind of what What's the right balance in terms of uh, applying land use policy to this area? Oops, sorry about that. Members? Happy to hop in, but I'm also happy to let someone take the, the first stab. Commissioner Carpenter? I guess I'll begin. Um, I'm just trying to wrap my mind around how a place type is going to prevent gentrification. I mean, if the demand is for um, single family homes, um, how will our applying any particular place type anywhere here going to prevent someone from deciding that they are quite willing to spend $300,000 to tear a house down and, and build a more expensive one, um, regardless of where, I mean, it, if the demand seems to be for single family homes and there's a, a tremendous willingness to pay a price short of something like a stabilization overlay, how is a place type going to address that? So, I mean, this is, yeah, this is an example where, I mean, the, the, the demand for single family homes and, and kind of if, if people, if what we're talking about is kind of happening on the ground level is really just investment kind of recurring and driving up prices, that's something the place that can't directly address, You're right? Uh, we have to defer to more detailed housing policy that um, is already in the works. Uh, and we also have to discuss, I guess, really, the, I guess the catch would be making sure we're discussing um, 
anti-displacement discussion, housing uh, um, affordability uh, concerns within the place type definitions and supporting kind of chapters in the land use plan. Um, so this is an instance where maybe the place tip is the same um, kind of current condition. I guess, I guess, I get, again, I, the way I'd frame the question here is, do we want to encourage um, other housing types within this area to help combat the, the housing price issue? Or do we leave it and promote preservation and um, look at other interventions that aren't land use uh, related? Yeah, Ruben, I have a question. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Hawkins. Um, I'm also on the Dallas County Historical Commission. Um, we received um, notice, particularly about I-30. So I-30 is going to be widened, and other design elements are going to be added to this. So there's going to be some type of displacement already. Um, how will the the place type choice? And excuse me for the plane. I'm outside. Um, how will the place type choice? Um, you know, change the trajectory of the residents, particularly those who reside next to I-30? Um, is I-30 in this imagery? I'm not, is that the Thornton freeway? It's Sorry. Thornton. Okay. Um, I mean, that that's an instance where, yeah, again, it's a, a site level thing that's happening that's that's displacing individual parcels that's not something that gets addressed at the citywide land use plan scale um i mean it, the concern i think maybe circles back to um are there policies we want to highlight in the plan um so that when people are displaced there's an option for them for relocation within the neighborhood um All right. Um, go ahead, Mr. Hawkins. Anything? Any further questions or comments there? I think I hold mine for now. I want to hear from the rest of the, uh, the members. Right. Sure. Mr. I, I'll. Yep, Mr. Lopez, go ahead. Mr. Nolan, I had a question about just the name, uh, housing affordability, uh, choice and displacement. I think uh, I'm, I'm I'm just having trouble wrapping my head around you know that title. When I think housing affordability, I'm thinking about a community where the city, the county, or the state, or philanthropy has come together and is willing to put uh, subsidy dollars uh, to help subsidize and close gaps on housing. That's certainly not the case that, uh, in Mount Auburn. Uh, to me, I think uh, the more appropriate name for this place type is, is displacement risk. Uh, just wanted to get your comments on that because when I think of housing affordability, I don't think Mount Auburn. Uh, as kind of the poster child for this, so it's it's very misleading, and 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 shows um, doesn't really uh, show uh, what's truly happening in this community. Okay. Uh, again, so this is one of one area of several that um, we work with staff to identify where housing affordability is a concern. And so in this instance, um, when you've got lots of teardowns happening, um, you know the market shifting rapidly. Um, people, there is a risk of displacement, like you said. So I, I, I don't. I mean, affordable housing, I think, and housing affordability are are not necessarily interchangeable. I think affordable housing, to your point, is is kind of where subsidy comes into play. But talking about housing affordability is really about price points and and income ranges in a community, and and having that mismatch, and and not having an opportunity to to live in the community you want to. Um, so I mean, I get what you're saying, but then, yeah, you know, it's. Uh, maybe it's housing affordability choice and displacement risk. Maybe sure. The word risk needs to be in there because yeah. I don't get it. Um, okay. Yeah, that's I think, fair. I think that yeah. Sense, yeah. Mr. Lopez, this is Lawrence Agu. Um, so I, I think that actually is really good. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's a really good uh, kind of nuance and tweak to what we have. Again, these are our initial stab at these issue topics, but I think your, your suggestion actually makes sense in terms of making that a little bit more focused to what's actually happening in this focus area. So we can apply that to uh, to this particular issue topic. Thanks, Lawrence. Appreciate it. Mr. Carpenter. Yes, I mean, it just seems to me that if, if we're going to try to attempt to um, prevent displacement and rapid gentrification through place types, that we're going to have to identify 
a place type that um, is called something like, you know, I don't know, uh, stabilized single family neighborhood or stabilized affordability neighborhood or something like that, but it's going to have to um, uh, require some recognition that some special steps are going to have to be taken in terms of zoning that some sort of overlay that's like what got done with La Bajada in West Dallas before Trinity Groves redeveloped. You know, the um, city uh, more or less at the same time or proactively overlaid that existing neighborhood because they knew with that sort of investment and change of character coming that those people were, you know, were going to be toast in terms of, you know, market forces. So if we are going to identify or, you know, recognize that this is going to happen to a to a lot of long established single family neighborhoods um, unless you know we we try to address it in a, a more proactive way and if it's going to be and if we're looking at a place type discussion then we're going to have to identify I think these neighborhoods as needing some sort of uh, you know zoning overlay protection how that's defined as a place type I don't know but so I just to jump in and clarify that I think those are good <coughs> points I just want to provide a little bit of information on how that could happen. So the place type won't solve displacement, nor is that the intent of the place type. But what we can do through the plan, through Forward Dallas as well, is specifically what you had just said, is identify some of those potential risk areas. So what partly, it's sort of dual purpose what these focus areas are. One, to talk about the broader place type discussion, and then identify issues within those place type areas or those focus areas. So for example, you know, to flesh out a little bit more that sort of an implementation, some implementation steps that would need to come out of the place type. You're gonna have a place type, you're gonna have this identified, and then we can start identifying in addition to that, the general guidance, some specific next steps. Some of it may be zoning. A lot of it will be from this forward Dallas plan. A lot of it's gonna be where we need to follow up with rezonings. Others can be, you know, this is an area we can potentially compile some overlay bubbles of this is where we have particular concern about displacement and we can provide sort of an overlay bubble. It's not the place type, but it is a, identifier on top of that place type from a citywide perspective of where maybe we need to take some more direct action once this land use plan is in place or simultaneously. And that may not be planning an urban design, design. That may be the housing department or economic development, but that we can coordinate those and we can sort of put an action plan together of things that need to happen. Um, so I just wanted to add that, that it's sort of, it's simultaneous. It's just, it's, determining place types, but then also within these certain areas, identifying other issues that we may need to address to implement the bigger place type. And I have one thing to add to that too as well. So as we're looking at uh, the broader perspective with these place types, there, there could be some of these focus areas that we're looking at it from a landers perspective, and we're, look, we're basically nothing's going to change uh, for a lot of these areas in the city but as we're thinking about issues like um, displacement risk, housing affordability, we need to think about you know, what we've developed with our uh, existing conditions report that 300,000 people are gonna be coming to the city in the next 20, 25 years. Um, how can we start to think about the current land uses that exist and what should future land uses start to look at in terms of possibly additional density, possible additional other types of mixes? So that's kind of the discussion we're trying to have with land uses. Uh, again, it doesn't solve these issues, these are issues that have come up from our research, and we want to start to think about what's the first step that we can do from this particular plan to start to think about how the future of, of Dallas could look like to either slow, uh, uh, I'm sorry, kind of reduce or uh, minimize how we how affordability happens or displacement happens, excuse me, in the city. And I think from a land use perspective with this example, um, this is emblematic of certain, um, several different uh, examples like this in the city if it means having to tweak the, the residential land use, for example, I'm not saying this is what we need to do, to be denser, that could be something that we can look into to apply here and in other areas that are similar 
to prevent um, or slow the, the, the displacement, the risk of displacement that we're seeing in the city. So those are kind of how we want to frame what we're looking at. So there might be one or two suggestions from a land use perspective here. Uh, but again, going fast forward into the, the final plan, even though there might not be a specific land use um, tweak or update in this area, we still want to be able to identify the issues uh, that we can apply through other policies that other policies can can use and, and move forward with what they're doing. For example, housing, like uh, Andrea mentioned, they can kind of take what we've seen, what we have identified, and apply that to their policies to be able to kind of further um, the particular issues and policies that we want to make sure gets um, addressed in the entire city, not just through this plan. I'll hop in with that. Go ahead. A couple thoughts. Um, one, when it comes to these place types, I, I think we need to think carefully for all of the residential ones about incorporating language that addresses potential for displacement and making sure that they're not used to to further displacement. You know, they may be deployed in, in some parts of you know further north where, where displacement is not that big of a concern, but you know, in the southern sector or in other parts of, of the city. We, we want to make sure that these aren't you know, being twisted in a way that, that would further displacement. Um, with regard to this specific Mount Auburn area, I'm pretty familiar with it, particularly the area north of Interstate 30. And there are those you know, pretty stable single family neighborhoods bounded by Columbia and Grand that, that are starting to feel those displacement pressures. But I, I think those Columbia and Grand Corridors offer some opportunities for additional housing. Um, there's some you know, vacant commercial and retail space along those areas um, that, that may be you know, good to consider for additional housing and some additional density there that might serve as kind of a release valve for some of the displacement pressures within the Mount Auburn you know, core neighborhood itself. So I think trying to find a place type that you know protects some of those you know, stable to you know risking you know you know to those some of the stable single family neighborhoods to some of those single family areas that are starting to to feel some instability because of of housing market pressures. I, I think a place type that that acknowledges those those major corridors of Columbia and and Grand as a potential release valve. To, for some additional housing density might be something to strongly consider in those areas. Commissioner Carpenter. Uh, you just said some of what I had intended to say. Yes, I think there are more appropriate places to add density nearby because I think it's a bit disingenuous to, to think that adding some apartment, some multifamily to the edge of these um, threatened single family neighborhoods is gonna offer any sort of relief to a specific homeowner, I mean, a family who um, sells out for th say $300,000 that they're being offered. I don't think it's realistic to think that it's a viable housing option for them to go and rent a brand new construction, you know, multi-bedroom um, apartment in, in one of these, uh, you know, adjacent places, you know, their their money is not gonna last very long at that point. It's, it's not really, um, uh, it's not the solution, I don't think, to displacing specific um, homeowners. I, I do think, yes, definitely the city has to add housing. And I think as uh, uh, Chair Rubin said, there are more appropriate places to do it. But that's it, thank you. All right. Any other comments, I guess, in this area? All right. I have a quick comment oh, that you, please. the area uh, north of I-30 between Samuel Grand uh, also uh, seems like you have a smattering of lots of things in there. So I'd be interested to hear what the community thinks about that sliver of land. And then just to piggyback on the discussion um, from the previous one uh, about buffers between residential and industrial, um, that south of I-30, there is some warehousing, there is some uh, heavy industry, and you might want to try to target that for future 
um, transition possibly to some kind of housing and, you know, maybe an adaptive reuse type of situation uh, where you, you don't come in and scrape the buildings, but maybe some of them are usable uh, in a different use. Sorry, where was the last mentioned where the adaptive reuse opportunity was? Uh, south of I-30, uh, okay. along B Berry Avenue and Grand. Uh, there's some gotcha. industry. Okay. And, uh, if you go up two uh, slides, you can yeah. see it better. Right. So referring to kind of this area in here. Yeah. The, okay. Thank you. Yep. All right. Anyone else any comments or questions before we move on to our third focus area? Um, right. So, the the third focus area type um, uh, focuses around uh, corridors uh, where we see an opportunity to kind of look at um, kind of the shift that's happening uh, in in the marketplace from a residential standpoint, from a commercial standpoint. Um, so these are corridors that are tend to be located in more of the urban or mixed residential areas in the community. Um, there is a um, shift happening where we're going from kind of more auto focus to people focused development. Uh, so how can we maybe reposition some of these outmoded um, shopping centers and, and retail areas to kind of re react to that trend? And and there's been kind of a, a lack of economic development in, in recent years. So these areas kind of have stalled a little bit in terms of um, new development and reinvestment happening. And so one of the areas um, highlighted in, in working with staff uh, was the, the Gaston Road corridor. Um, so um, you've got um, the Central Expressway um, kind of main interchange on the south end, uh, and then we're going north, northeast, um, coming into um, the Lakewood Country Clubs on the, on the other end of the, the corridor here. And so um, Baylor Medical Center is kind of the anchor uh, on the south end. Um, any notes from staff on this area uh, before we dive in? Yeah, so this is uh, Patrick Blades again. Uh, so the Gaston corridor, um, one of the reasons why staff identified this, um, again, you know, historically, Gaston was developed years and years and years ago with mansions on both sides of it. Um, eventually, uh, by the 70s, um, it was redeveloped with um, um, low density apartments, um, some auto centric development um, that occurred all along there. Uh, we've seen really in the past 20, 10 years, um, some redevelopment that has started to occur along there. Um, and really with the gas and corridor and um, as some members of the community mentioned, um, even you know, Grand and Samro, we also looked at those corridors and, and those are also um, good examples. Um, really trying to understand uh, that corridor and its future, right? It, it's it's kind of the um, is my commute more important than your community uh, corridor, where um, it's either drive-through restaurants and things for people to pick up stuff on the way home, or is it things for people that are living um, in that corridor or along that corridor? Um, and yeah. So your to those comments though. So we've got kind of that that auto-oriented commercial right that's getting a little bit dated um, but it's still functioning along these corridors serving a use um, but it's having kind of a detrimental effect on community character and it's, it's a place for the the residents that are kind of more than interior blocks is that fair um, to, to say patrick yes um and uh, one of the reasons why we uh, chose the gas quarter just as an example is because also uh, transportation and mobility is looking at this quarter specifically as well. Uh, but again, um, Gaston, Ross, um, you know, Brian, Samuel, uh, even, you know, Jefferson, there are a lot of examples of this type of corridor within the city of Dallas. Mm -hmm. okay. And so when you look at the, the current, again, building blocks approach, um, there's a sliver of urban neighborhood, I think just really recognizing that this small lot and apartments happening in this this one component otherwise it was framed as a residential neighborhood um, and i think this is an example um, 
where, you know, I think we can discuss what is the nature of these areas. And really, if you look at the existing land use, you can see kind of that um, kind of lots of things happening, right? There's a shift in block scale happening uh, towards the south end. Um, a lot of more mix of those uses. Um, Baylor kind of serving as an anchor to a surrounding district. Um, you've got the corridor itself with these edge kind of retail bleeding into the neighborhood. And then you've got this kind of unique neighborhood node up um, kind of on the north end that is its own kind of destination as well. So uh, the question is, what's that right mix of, of development that we want to encourage in this area um, to, to start to get at some of the um, discussion that was just had about the, the nature of the retail that's happening? So any thoughts from the group on kind of the, the future for this area from a land use perspective? Uh, one quick thought. I love the idea that you're talking about walkability and trying to move away from this um, auto-centric uh, way of thinking. Uh, so to me, and, you know, talking to the neighborhood, it seems like you would want to establish, uh, you know, like a zone, five minute walk, 10 minute walk, and you know, what, what should we be able to reach in those times? Uh, it seems like retail, uh, also open space would be really important. So the idea of kind of a, that five to 15, the 10 to 15 minute neighborhood where you've got a lot of things available within that short kind of walk shed. Yeah, and you, you start to see that if you go back two slides, uh, uh, I think pre, pre there you go, um, that you're starting to get some of that mix. Um, so again, you know, just to show a big sea of yellow for, uh, residential, I think misses the point, uh, that the finer texture here is critical. If you really want to make a walkable city, um, can I walk to a store rather than drive? Can mm -hmm. I walk to an open space and park? Um, I think you, you need those mixes in the neighborhood. Uh, rather than saying, and traditionally what we've done is jump in the car and go to the shopping center. Um, but how can we encourage mm -hmm. walkability in a community like this? I think I would echo uh, Mr. Goldstein's uh, thoughts. I live in its corridor. I live on the, um, in what's called the Wilson Historical District, which is the north uh, south point in this area. And that area um, is one of the most walkable areas in Dallas. It's also not a developmental district. It's owned by the Meadows Foundation. So it's a different type of mm -hmm. um, corridor, but it also starts the bike path that goes up a um, uh, parallel street to Gaston, which is Swiss. That's, it's, a, it's a street with uh, bike signs on it. It's not a protected bike lane on the street, but at least bikers can go with uh, you know, travel the street with less traffic and there's some tree canopy on it. On the other side, though, on Gaston side, where it is more brown and black, there are very few tree covers and very few walkable neighborhoods, streets, um, and no protective bike lanes at all. So I, I do think that, um, you know, noticing the different types of places in here is really important, but also the investment in where people are uh, most the most dense, I think, probably has the least amount of like things like tree tree canopy cover, um, and the ability for it to become a uh, even more walkable community, because you have some anchors like Baylor, and then you have uh, the Lakewood uh, district shopping district on the top of it. Mr. Carpenter. Yeah. I I'm very familiar with this uh, area because I worked at the Meadows Foundation for 30 years. So the southern portion of this um, corridor, I, th I think the character is pretty established and, as Mr. Hawkins said, pretty walkable. Uh, there may be um, some limited possibilities for redevelopment there on the north side of Gaston around Oak, sort of stretching toward Hall. But then you have the Baylor campus. Um, and accompanying lodging uses have pretty much redeveloped or coming with uh, pretty walkable with some uh, new retail and restaurants all the way to um, the street that is at the east side of the um, Baylor campus. Um, is that Haskell where there's Starbucks and is that is that Haskell with 
Capital One and Aldi and all that. There's some old shopping center area that I think is fairly ripe for redevelopment. There's a dollar store and you know just kind of a generic old shopping center. And then then you pick up again to the um, low rise um, apartments that I believe just changed hands. Mm -hmm. So there may be some redevelopment going on there. But yeah, I think the, the most opportunity there is what I'll call <laughs> the middle chunk. But um, I think the southern portion is is pretty well, the character is pretty well established. And Commissioner Carpenter, I want to clarify my statements. Um, it's walkable in the in the Dallas fashion, where it's unsafe walkable. You know, there are no uh, street signs, uh, very limited uh, street uh, painting. So it is it is an unsafe walkable neighborhood. You know, if that makes sense. <laughs> Okay, I'm well, relatively walkable <laughs> compared to some of the neighborhoods I see in West Dallas, but yes, thank you. Point taken. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll just hop nice. We'll, we'll agree with, with several of the other members' comments that I think this area has the density to transform into a much more walkable area. I, I do think Gaston is, is challenging in that there is the, the hospital that is a major, you know, regional attractor there, which I think we're going to have a hard time in that area as much as I, I'd like it to be revisioned to be less auto oriented, you know, with, with Baylor attracting so many throughout the region for, for medical care. I think it's going to require really sharpening some pencils in order to figure out how to make that area, you know, right around Baylor more walkable, but the middle area you know, going up to that Lakewood shopping center, I think has real opportunity. And the only thing I'll add is that, you know, there's also Live Oak and Ross, which, which presents some significant additional opportunities on, on both sides of, of Gaston. So when we, you know, revisit this area, you know, throughout the forward Dallas process, you know, I would just think carefully about Live Oak, Ross, and Gaston. You know, maybe is 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 gas. I know that there's a corridor study going along Gaston right now, but if we you know, maybe we sh do all three, maybe we shift to Live Oak, maybe we shift to Rock, maybe we do two of the three. But just I want to think big here because I think with the density here, there's a true opportunity. I have a question, Mrs. Lawrence, for uh, Mr. Hawkins. I know you you've mentioned several times uh, the difference between Dallas walkable and Chicago walkable. Uh, is there anything specific to kind of your familiarity with Chicago that in terms of its walkability that could be applied and looked at here in certain uh, similar type locations in the city? Yeah, uh, so it's a pedestrian centered uh, kind of way of thinking about walkability um, instead of the auto centric uh, walkability or lack of walkability in Dallas. Uh, so there's a, a very contested corner right here on the, I would say, um, Live Oak and Good Latimer. Uh, that, that is one of the most dangerous corners in the city, according to the walkability and bike, bike, biking study that was done recently. Um, cars are allowed to have the right of way over pedestrians. And I think that's the number one thing is, you know, there's no warning signs for cars to stop for pedestrians anywhere in this neighborhood beyond the stop sign. There are no kind of blinking lights, things like that. Um, so that's number one. I, I would say two is um, to encourage walkability, you need can tree canopy cover because Dallas is a hot city in the summer and the fall and the spring. And um, particularly the Gaston corridor, I'm thinking of that. Uh, there are tons of retail areas there but folks are gonna drive, continue to drive because there's no uh, tree canopy cover to, to, to uh, cool off the streets. Uh, and then lastly, um, other modes of transportation. There's uh, the dart that goes through here. It has a Baylor stop, um, but the, the kind of secondary modes of uh, transportation like uh, scooters and uh, bikes, um, other things that can be a carriage don't, the infrastructure for them don't exist right now. So. Um, and then uh, lastly, you know, I want to make it my biggest um, con um, frustrations with the city of Dallas is the, the ability to walk to a park um, with folks who are next to the uh, residential park. They can do that. But the most uh, other everybody else, they, they drive to a park. If we can find ways to creating uh, walk paths, safe passageways to parks, 
I think that will be helpful. Uh, thank you so much. Mr. Hawkins, that's a, that's a great list right there. Thanks for sharing all that. Um, I just want to jump in and, and reiterate two of them. Yeah, walkability to parks is critical. So I think as much as going to retail, you want to make those circles to open space and parks. And then also uh, this tree canopy, you know, it, it's um, shade. It makes the street walkable, but it's also a, a health and equity issue um, in terms of the heat island and the potential uh, health problems there. So trees uh, are a critical part of this. I would say these walkable neighborhoods. I would also add just, you know, bump outs and intersections, vertical delineators, you know, doing things like that to create separation between pedestrians and vehicles will go a long way as well. Sorry. Sorry, um, and just, you know, uh, 1 thing to think about in this area too, and in many areas, I know this area somewhat because I have dogs and we go to the dog park. So. Um, there are a lot of us that do that and a lot of us that can't walk from surrounding neighborhoods to that um, area as well. So kind of thinking holistically about that as everyone has discussed, how long does it take you to get to a park and can you get there without a car? Another thing to think about uh, with regard to uh, these urban corridors is in Dallas, we have just a, a nasty habit of creating uh, Buildings or, or, or undertaking buildings with huge parking lots uh, with uh, without the setback. We have, uh, if you want it to be more walkable, those setbacks need to be near the street. And um, it, it seems, and, and Gaston is a prime example of this big stores uh, not near the street with big parking lots right in front of them. Uh, we've got to get away from that if, if this is truly what we want to do. Mr. Lopez, I think you bring up something interesting too with simply parking and what role, you know, in place types, is there a role that parking minimums can or do not play in creating place types and what that looks like? To add to both of those those comments, um, and I don't know if this is a, a different department, but um, the planning of street signs, street poles, and other things. Um, on um, pedestrian walkways is probably the, one of the biggest frustrations for walkability. Um, I, I, I don't know um, what department is, is in charge of that. And then I think lastly, uh, with construction, uh, construction also um, impedes the right of way of pedestrians and there needs to be some more protection for pedestrians when con construction is happening um, with buildings. Um, there's little to no um, protection of pedestrians when that happens currently. This is Lawrence from the city. I think this is actually a fantastic conversation. And I think we're also starting to talk about how do we start to implement the type of place that we want to see here. So I think as we as, as we kind of look at what the, the place types and land use can and can't do, I think what this document can do is identify the policies that we want moving forward uh, for other departments to pick up as we kind of try to build upon what these places need to look like. So although we were not specific to, you know, where street signs and those more details need to go, we can identify that that's a priority. That's, that's what needs, needs to be looked at in some of these locations uh, citywide and also identifying in these particular focus areas. So I think all of this is I'm actually jotting down notes. These are all things that, although there won't be specific to land use, I think there are specific to land use policies that can kind of translate to other departments that can implement uh, some of these suggestions. All right, and it, it, it should be noted that in addition to this, this matrix that we keep on showing you, this is just the shorthand summary, but each place type, when we finalize this plan, is gonna have a series of kind of urban design considerations and guidelines we wanna include along with the discussion about land use mix, along with the discussion about kind of transition areas and, and um, the buffers we've been talking about. Um, we can definitely work in discussion about, you know, within mixed residential and urban residential, we wanna see kind of a shift towards front loaded retail. We want to see a reduction of those setbacks. We want to see a cadence happening along uh, pedestrian ways, right? So we can we can work in discussion of uh, some of those urban design considerations as part of the definition of what is a desired place. So um, even though this place type might have or this area might have two or three place types 
that are kind of sticking to maybe what's on the ground currently. And we just, it doesn't mean that those areas can't be improved. Um, so a lot of what we'll be including the plan is kind of how do we make Dallas as a whole, a better version of itself? Like what are the things we want to work on as a community? Um, so when we talk about this area being, let's say, you know, an, an urban residential neighborhood in portions, uh, that means we really want to emphasize creating pocket parks, uh, and, and, and access to, um, quality open space, right? So we can work in those discussions as we define these place types, um, it's not going to be something that pops out at you on a map where you see the green dot, but it'll be part of the discussion about what a place that place type is. Um, one, one map though, that I think we would want to <laughs> consider or to add data and help make decisions moving forward would be um, hardscape, uh, particularly relating to commissioner Lopez's observation about the way that we typically do parking lots here in Dallas and, um, you know, these, these are becoming more and more of, again, a health issue in terms of flooding uh, in the city and also in terms of the heat island. So if we could see where some of these large paved areas are um, and, and see the heat islands in the city, I think that'll be really critical information to help us make decisions about land use. Now, that's a great point. And that's actually one of the analysis that we uh, looked at with our existing conditions report, uh, looking at the impermeable and permeable uh, surface areas in the city. And that was also being, that also helped us to look at uh, where Heat Island is more prevalent versus other parts of the city. Uh, as we're looking at, you know, closer to the core and closer to other areas that are developed, those because of um, current development standards, those do are, those do have higher uh, heat island and, and heat temperatures as well. But I think that's a great point that you mentioned, Mr. Goldstein, that we have to kind of look at balancing, you know, new development versus what that causes on the ground from a temperature perspective. And that's something that we've started to look at, but I think we can kind of show that further as we start to kind of have this uh, community discussion with what needs to happen in the future. Thanks, Lawrence. Are we ready for our next item? Sure. And Lawrence, what, what is our time end time that we're working towards? Sorry. Just want to make sure we can get through content. Uh, so it's currently 1036. I think we had aimed for 11. Um, but I think we can stay for 15 more minutes. So let's see if we can try to knock it out by 1115. Okay. Okay. Uh, that'd be great. Do you right. want me to walk through the three focus areas and then we'll decide if we have time to walk through the mapping or how do you want to do it? Just keep going. Let's keep uh, actually that's, that's a good point. Go through the uh, the the last three just to kind of get a quick overview of the, the locations that we're looking at, and then we'll we'll jump into I believe what are the three main topics that we have left. So we have connectivity and TODs with Elam and Buckner Station. Uh, we have the um, kind of catalytic development areas with International District, and then the rural and greenfield areas with Kleberg. Okay, and I think I want to ask a quick question to the committee members. Um, I, I, I would like your perspective on which ones to focus on uh, with the remaining 30 minutes that we have left. Uh, so there are three different topics, three different locations. Um, I'm not sure, Commissioner Rubin, if you want to ask the audience in terms of which ones to focus on. Sure. Um, members, is there any preference among the three? Probably lean towards TOD, but yeah, I probably lean towards TOD out of the three remaining. I'm certainly happy to hear the other. If folks feel differently, we can do another one. I would say TOD or revitalizing and developing since that's a housing equity issue. Okay. All right, let's do the TOD. Okay. So, yeah, the next. Number four here is the connectivity and TUDs. Um, again, so really looking at mostly where DART rail stations either existing or proposed, as well as um, kind of major institutional players, that, again, kind of areas of change. Um, these are areas we've identified where we think there's something happening uh, or an asset that we built off uh, where we want to see change occurring. So um, Elon Buckner Station, um, we're kind of at this key intersection point. Um, and I don't know if we've got the, the stationary, you can see in this area here, 
um, so again, kind of the land use perspective, you have the rail line coming through. Um, Lawrence Patrick, this is the end of the line station, correct? Yes, and uh, again, um, part of the reason for identifying this area um, is that historically there is a very large parking lot there and there's a lot of parking there. Um, so there's ample opportunity for uh, transit oriented or transit adjacent development. So you've got a mix of happening here with kind of highway oriented commercial happening along Buckner and then along uh, Great Trinity Forest Way. Uh, some residential um, kind of basically along the edges and the centerpiece being the station and um, some industrial kind of uh, on the opposite side of the station there. So in the previous planning efforts, this is highlighted really for commercial and then residential, um, residential neighborhood being the, the yellow here. So that gets us to the aerial. So um, just from a development opportunity standpoint, you can see there's really kind of areas that are underdeveloped, um, kind of you got some rural kind of previously platted type residential parcels here, um, some vacancies, uh, and then this really auto-oriented kind of commercial, kind of older commercial areas. So, um, so I used to work over here. Mm -hmm. uh, I used to work on Buckner and 30, but I used to get off at this dart station. Um, again, this is a very um, neglected part of the city from the city of Dallas's perspective. Um, once you leave that rail station, there's no tree cover. Uh, even the dart uh, stations where you catch the bus are also very unprotected. So uh, definitely lack of tree canopy, lack of um, safe uh, walkability, na walkable neighborhoods, um, lack of mixed use when it comes to residential park. I don't even know if there's a um, like a usable park right here next to this star station. There's some like open um, kind of undeveloped areas, uh, but again, those lead to um, all kind of uh, unwanted uses. So mm -hmm. um, it's just a lack of um, thought, well thought out planning for a community in this area. And the unwanted uses you're referring to like the auto shops and the outdoor storage and that kind of. No, those, those are actually planned uses by community members, I believe. I'm talking about yeah. unwanted uses like empty parks with trash in them, right? Because there's no planned use for, or no, um, you know, no, it could have been a park. It could have been a, um, a community center, right? The Buckner, um, not Buckner, um, Eastfield College um, is over here, right? So um, that's mostly parking, right? So there's, there's auto-centric use and not necessarily people use. Gotcha. Yeah, I don't know that I'm seeing a uh, park or open space in this circle. There might be one on the east side. Yeah, I don't think there's any formal open space in this area at all. That is correct. Hey, Brandon, could you uh, go to the land use as well? Just to Yep. Refer, refer we're looking at. Yeah, so um, so vacant areas, some of which are being used for outdoor storage and parking. Um, no open space that is correct. I mean, again, you know, I'm looking here just at these colors. It looks like the single family uh, residential is maybe a third, 33% of this circle. And again, not to have any parks seems just super problematic. With the industrial right in the middle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do have, there is this you know, the 
creek here. So you think that there is an opportunity for maybe some open space of some kind um, to use that amenity, but. I've noticed that several of these focus areas are, are divided by highways. And, and I think one thing that we need to think about is, you know, when they are divided by highways is, is providing, you know, I, I don't know how many people are willing or even able to cross highways in these areas, but providing, you know, equitably on, on both sides uh, of the highway. I, I noticed the same thing in the Mount Auburn area that went south of I-30. So we need to think carefully about that. Um, you know, I'm not super familiar with this area myself, but I think, you know, potentially looking at some of that industrial and, and moving it towards more of an urban mixed use, you know, in our land use vision might be the right move considering that the transit proximity, but that's mm -hmm. just a very tentative comment at this point. Yeah. I mean, so this is go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I also, uh, not only CF Hahn, which is this, uh, a highway, but great Trinity forest way, even though it doesn't look like a highway in this map is also a highway. Um, it had two lanes and kind of, um, kind of the flood ditches next to it. Um, and I would also, and this is, I don't know how this is categorized in, in the plan, but, um, in neighborhoods such as this one that I've worked in, um, these streets like Buckner, which is in some cases six lanes, mm -hmm. uh, are also like highways because they have very uh, few uh, pedestrian infrastructure protections. And so they become speedways uh, without um, the use of, um, I think the, there's some school barriers on, on a couple of these streets, but other than the school barriers, they become highways as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can't have transit oriented development if you can't leave the station to go to something else, right? Um, or vice versa. I have a question. Commissioner Carpenter? Does the transit oriented development place type um, imply a certain distance from the transit station? So uh, just to, for clarity, I think we're not looking at a particular place type, we're looking at a particular issue that a place type can address. So I think um, specifically to your question, there isn't a particular land use that kind of is specific to TODs, but we can have uh, our investigation in terms of what combination of land uses could allow for uh, better walkability. Um, for this particular example, this is gonna be a particular node um, at this location, how do we, uh, one, combine some, some of these land uses to be able to kind of behave and kind of create a district or a, a place that people want to walk in and move about. So that's kind of how we're looking at it. Um, to answer your question, there's no land use or uh, place type that's specific to TODs. But is there a distance? I mean, is it a quarter of a mile from the transit station? Is it half a mile? Is it just, a, is it just the property that DART owns itself? I mean, what, what, what is the implication of the transit-oriented development place type? I know this came up with the West Oak Cliff area plan where, you know, residents were very amenable to redevelopment happening on that parking lot, but they weren't quite so um, happy with um, denser development encroaching into their single-family neighborhoods. Right. For our analysis, I think we looked at it was a quarter-mile uh, analysis. Um, just to kind of identify the locations, but the, the number in terms of like where that needs to look at and how it kind of flares out from a particular station that hasn't been developed yet. I think that'd be more specific to the community, how they want that these, this, this particular node and other nodes to, to behave in their area. Thank you. Members, anything else on this one? All right, do we have time to go to number five? Yes. Yeah. So five uh, is vitalizing and developing areas. So basically areas where we know there's kind of these key catalyst projects that are um, creating pressure um, for redevelopment. Um, the international district uh, is shown here as one example. Do you want me to hit the item six to Lawrence, just to make sure we can talk about that? Yeah, we can. Thank okay. You. And then item six uh, is rural and agricultural and greenfield areas. 
Um, these are areas where um, infrastructure access um, is poor, either it's lacking water, it might be lacking sewer. Um, you know, these are generally kind of very rural in character right now. Um, large natural areas kind of mixed in. Some of the cases it's kind of brownfield areas that are experiencing a transition. Um, and in this area, um, Clayburg um, was really identified as kind of a great example where you've got, um, again, that mix of the really deep lot single family um, where there's opportunities for an individual um, kind of agriculture kind of happening on individual lots. Also just opportunities for larger scale ag because of the, the nature of available land. Uh, but you also have some encroachment or some development happening in these areas where you've got more dense development happening along the corridors. Um, so those are the two kind of remaining focus areas. And then we also had some next steps we want to make sure we read into the group. So um, Lawrence, do we want to workshop through the maps right now or do you want to yeah. focus on next steps with our last few minutes here? I would let's go with Kleberg uh, just because I think we I'd uh, like to have some conversation related to that area. I believe we've talked about the International District a few times loosely. Uh, we can touch on that, but then we can kind of transition to the next steps uh, with this committee. Right. Okay. So with Kleberg, I mean, you can see from a land use perspective, um, you have single family detached. Again, those really deep lot, um, kind of rural in character, other than a couple of subdivisions um, kind of along the edges. Um, a lot of vacant land. So really it's unimproved, could be something. And so for these more rural areas, the, the question is, do we do we really wanna push for transition to something more intense? Um, or are we okay with having these areas kind of remain kind of rural in character uh, per kind of the residents that are living there? Um, maybe it's allowing for um, kind of different land use regulations to apply in this area that allow for larger lots, uh, allow for agriculture uh, on a higher and more intense scale. Um, and recognizing that again, infrastructure isn't in place to accommodate the more dense development right now. So um, if we wanna encourage a, a transition to something else uh, from a place that perspective, uh, we need to um, provide that, that infrastructure in the future. <clears throat> Is there an existing area plan in process for this area or am I mistaken? Uh, in terms of area plan, no, but we can give you more feedback in terms of what's currently happening there. There's um, a land use study for East and West Kleberg from 2007. So, and there's been, and there's also an authorized hearing that is on the books for this, for this area. And this area is, Pretty unique in terms of um, its land use composition versus the rest of the city. One of the, this is not as dense as the rest of the city, a lot more agricultural um, land uses that exist in this area. So I think it's important just to, to look at it from that perspective is a pretty unique um, area in the city. And I think when we go out into the community, they'll be able to, they'll be able to give us a little bit more context in terms of how they use the land in their area and what they want that to be. Um, but I think for our discussion and our purposes, uh, looking at, you know, greenfield areas, which generally are a little bit more ripe for development, if that's the, the intent, uh, but then also looking at agricultural and rural uh, land uses, how should that play into um, the vision for the city in this particular area uh, moving forward? I'm going to go back to the same topic again. I mean, I think Typically, the, the, these areas kind of is, uh, lead to sprawl of the city, right? That the typical scenario is to take this and develop it and change the density because the land's so valuable. Um, but I, I just think, you know, we, we really need to start thinking about sprawl um, and from a land use perspective, what, how much per, permeable land we can continue to envelop in the Metroplex and around Dallas uh, before we get into some really serious problems uh, that have already started with flooding, heat, uh, health issues. Um, you know, it just seems to me that we need to leave certain amounts of land, not that it has to be the same use, but that we can't just continue to sprawl. We have to do it in a controlled, logical, sensible way. Mm -hmm. 
I for, struggle with these areas myself, the more agricultural areas in Dallas. On, on one hand, I agree with Mr. Goldstein that, you know, there is a sense of, of sprawl, you know, when we start to think about developing these areas. But on the other hand, you know, throughout the region, there's existing sprawl when, you know, folks move further and further out into second ring, third ring suburbs and things like that. And I don't know what the, the net win is here. Is it incorporating additional housing into these areas while being very sensitive to permeability and other issues? Or is it, you know, letting that sprawl go further and further out, people's commutes get longer and longer, you know, someone could, you know, we could put a subdivision in here and have people with, you know, 20, 32 minute commutes downtown or, you know, as we know, people are commuting over an hour to downtown from Ellis County, from Collin County, so on and so forth. So while I think we need to think carefully about sprawl within city limits, I, I do think we need to think about where that goes if we don't add additional housing in these areas. May I? Oh, yes. Commissioner Carpenter. I do think that these um, agricultural areas um, that are largely in the southern sector need a, a, a great deal of um, thoughtful consideration because what we we're confronted with on CPC on a regular basis is request after request after request for large warehouses, for truck stops, for commercial motor vehicle parking lots that I don't, I mean, I think we're just going to have to consider what the implications are. What do we need these areas to be? Are they going to be, um, do they better serve the city and the residents as um, rural residential areas? Do they need more housing options? Um, one of the the broader implications for changing over large swaths of agricultural land to these industrial uses is we're increasing the heat island effect. The, if you look at the the, the map that uh, was recently in the paper identifying the the heat island um, areas, the industrial areas are the um, seem to be um, you know focus spots for heat island. So. I don't think it's a good land use trend to just watch, to let these agricultural land just just drift along with where the demand is for warehousing and trucking. And that, that warehousing, you know, usually converts to huge paved areas um, with a, you know, single story building on it. Um, Problematic. Members, other thoughts? All right, do we want to hop to next steps? Yes, we can do that. Okay, great. All right, so next steps, Lawrence, through. Yes, um, so next steps, we're looking through the rest of the year. Uh, several things that are currently happening and going to be occurring as well. So one, we're going to continue to analyze the focus areas that we talked about today, the topics that we looked at as well, in addition to um, the 70 plus other areas that we're uh, trying to address through our discussion. Um, so I think it's important to know that although we're going to be looking at, you know, specific focus areas with this plan, that doesn't mean that's all we're going to be looking at. Uh, that is going to also is, is entailing that there's going to be probably further study that needs to happen, uh, probably through a neighborhood plan or more, more specific land use type of analysis that will occur after Fort Dallas. But I think um, the discussion that we had today is just the beginning point of having this conversation. Uh, we have... Uh, several community workshops uh, planned for this month and next month. Uh, the first one is going to begin actually um, October 19th, and we'll show more information about where that's located. Uh, so the first series, the first round of workshops is going to touch on, I think what some of our community members mentioned here, is just getting the community to understand just what place types are, um, how that applies to what we're doing with Ford Dallas, 
just a basic understanding in terms of connecting the concept of, of land use, place types, and how that leads to what we're trying to do with Forward Dallas. And the second series, the second round of workshops is going to start in November, and that's going to talk more about how we how can we start to apply and think about these place types and land uses um, in, a ge in a geographic manner, and how can we apply um, the, the place types that were kind of vetted and talked through at the beginning of, of this month into what needs to look at in our future land use map. So that's when we're going to start that conversation in the next two months is having a community conversation in terms of what these place types are, how should they be applied geographically, and then starting to summarize the feedback from the community, from this body, and other bodies that we're speaking with um, in terms of what that looks like. So the idea is by the time we get to December, we're then starting just to collate and put together the feedback that we've seen and heard from all community members. This is not the end of community engagement. We just know because the holidays are coming up, uh, we won't be able to engage as much as we want to in the, the month of December. So staff's going to use that time to summarize what we've heard so far and just draft a, a summary and just draft recommendations that the community has, has uh, given to us so far. And then kind of fast forwarding to next year, we're going to be beginning uh, engagement again in terms of showing the community what they initially mentioned, starting to uh, bring that to the fore in terms of how that applies and how that affects their communities and what we need to do to tweak or modify um, those recommendations that we saw. Uh, so if you go to the next slide. This is the list of the first round of engagement that's going to occur uh, throughout the city. So these are, uh, we're breaking up this into you know, planning service districts. Um, those are d developed by geographical boundaries. Uh, those typically may remain the same. So the first uh, series, the first workshop is going to be at the Bachman Rec Center, October 19th uh, from 6 to 7.30 p.m. And those are in, in the, envisioned to start to speak to the communities about the place types, get an understanding of what those place types are, and then generally starting to think about what, what and how those place types apply to their communities. We'll then be coming back into these uh, service districts, which are color coded differently, to be able to start to unpack um, the geographical location of these place types. But the first round is primarily focused just on getting an understanding of what the place types are and how we should be either modifying or tweaking uh, those place types moving forward. Uh, next slide. So, so I guess that is our conversation. Um, we'll, I'm just going to let this moment for some Q&A just in, in case anybody has any questions related to the, the upcoming visioning workshops. Um, the information that we put here will continue to update and create a summary of what those are and we'll find a way to give this back out to the community members and the club so they know what we've developed so far, but we're going to be using this um, in addition to what the community is going to be telling us in the next few weeks to start to put together and package uh, what the community wants from a land use perspective, what their vision needs to look like or wants to look like uh, as we go out into the community. And we're open for any feedback, um, any direction in terms of how to do that. Uh, please, for those who are in any of these areas that are on the map, uh, if you're located or you have any partnerships with anybody in these areas, we strongly uh, uh, ask that you please connect with us and with them to be able to uh, show up at these uh, visioning workshops. These are just one of the many workshops that we'll be having there on the course of the year, but it's, it's critical that uh, we partner with the community to make our engagement um, um, successful, because if that's not the case, this won't be successful. So we need a community partnership in terms of being able to go out to these locations and be able to get the feedback that we need uh, from this phase of community engagement. Um, anything else, Brandon, you want to add? No, I just, and again, I think like Lawrence said, this is, we, we understand education is a key piece. So that's really what this first round of engagement and the, the following round are about. Uh, so the comments that were made at the beginning of this work, kind of workshop, um, you know, we are taking that seriously. Um, and I think we've slowed down the process to make sure that that happens correctly. So we are trying to our best to respond to all the input we're getting uh, as we go along here. Members, questions, feedback for staff? 
All right. Last chance, anyone? All right. It is 11.04 a.m. and we've reached the end of our agenda. Oh, can we get a motion to adjourn? So moved. We have a motion by Commissioner Carpenter. Can I have a second? Second.